Good morning and welcome to the webcast. This is our third session for the virtual 2020 Building Opportunity Conference from Moss Adams, providing insight into the current challenges facing companies operating in the built world. Over the next few weeks, we are hosting several sessions covering topics such as how COVID-19 is shaping the landscape of cities and infrastructure, economic impacts of newly passed bills, business planning in an election year, and post-election tax planning and considerations. More information for each session, including registration, are available in the links provided in your resources widget here on ON24, as well as on mossadams.com. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Thank you. And now let's get to our session this morning. Residential investor, developer, and ownership trends. I'm pleased to introduce our panel today. Let's start with today's host, Chris Paris, a partner with our construction and real estate practice uh, here at Moss Adams. Chris, I'll go ahead and turn things on over to you. Thanks, Gerald, and hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, we have a, we've put together a really great panel today. Um, I think each of these folks is kind of bring a unique perspective um, to the residential real estate market and and where we stand today and what the future could potentially bring. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just start off by introducing each of these three folks. And Lisa, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and start with you. Um. Hi, my name is Lisa Colacursio. I'm the Managing Director of Real Estate Fund Management at Gemdale. Uh, Gemdale is one of the top 20 developers in China. Uh, we operate in 50 cities with about 25,000 employees. We started investing here in 2013. Um, we've been doing ground up development and as well as uh, investing in uh, existing value add assets um, and have put about $3 billion to work. Um, I'm particularly focused on the value add space, both residential and uh, office. 
Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and then John, thanks for joining us as well. If you could go ahead and introduce yourself, that would be great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Uh, my name is John Ho. I'm the CEO of Lancy Homes. Uh, we are a U.S. home builder uh, headquartered out here in Southern California, Newport Beach. Uh, we operate uh, in Northern Southern California, Arizona, as well uh, as New York. Uh, we've been operating here for about seven years now. We're the wholly owned subsidiary of a publicly listed home builder on the Hong Kong Exchange. Uh, and happy to be here. Thank you, John. Um, and last but certainly not least, Brad Griggs, thanks for being with us this morning. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Um, Lake Griggs Properties uh, is a local development company here in the Bay Area. Uh, we do primarily multifamily uh, housing. Um, we uh, have been around for about 10 years um, and uh, I'm a managing partner for the company and look forward to participating this panel. <clears throat> Thanks, Brad. Well, um, we're, before we get into the, uh, the panel here, we're going to start off with our first polling question. So what best describes your role in the real estate industry? Um, are you A, a developer, sponsor, general partner, operator, B, an investor, C, a lender, or D, other? So again, the purposes of the, of the polling question is just for those of you that are looking to get CPE, there's going to be a total of four questions and we just need you guys to answer three of them in order to get the CPE credit. So we'll give it about a minute or so here for everybody to, to respond. All right, so it looks like we've got a, uh, a pretty good mix here. Um, half, a little over half in the other category, um, and then roughly 45% roughly uh, or so in the investor and the sponsor category. So great, thanks. That gives us a good, just frames things up for us to, to give us a better indication of who the audience is. So thank you. So. Um, Obviously, the residential real estate market, we've seen a lot of movement coming out of the last great recession. Um, so over the last decade or so, and then um, a tremendous amount of short-term disruption ever since the, the pandemic hit. Um, with today's panel, what we were trying to do is put together um, people with varying, um, varying points of view depending upon the sector of the residential market that they're in. Um, so I think each one of them is gonna bring a unique perspective to, uh, to where we're at in the market now and what the future could hold as difficult as that is to predict. Um, so some of the things we're gonna be talking about is just what the future could look like for urban infill, um, new development projects, suburban development. We'll also touch on capital markets, the financing and the interest rate environment that we're in, and some of these new regulations that are rolling out um, at the state and local level, um, like rent control or eviction moratoriums, um, and just other issues that are out there that could potentially affect the market. So the first item that we were planning on talking about just has to do with, we're hearing a lot about migration from high density urban areas to, to lower density suburban areas. Even before COVID hit, we were starting to hear more about this trend. So, so the question really is, how large of an impact are you guys seeing on this? Do you think it's a short-term impact? Do you think it's a long-term impact? So this trend of kind of um, some movement away from more concentrated urban areas to more suburban areas. What do you, what do you think about that? So, um, John, I know you, you guys have a pretty good mix of both um, you, you, 
urban and then some suburban developments as well. So we'd love to hear your perspective on that. Sure. Uh I think uh, for us, one thing's been interesting. Uh, when we started investing here in the U.S. back in 2013, uh, there certainly was a focus in uh, building, let's say, uh, communities and residential um, uh, projects that were more, uh, I would say, higher average selling prices. Uh, they tended to be more in the move-up segments. Um, and it was frankly when we came out of the last great financial crisis, it was an area where there was a lot of demand. Um, those were the that was the uh, market segment that afford uh, obtain mortgages, and there was a big focus for us to build um, that product type. We did that in Four Bay Area in San Francisco, uh, in LA, uh, and also in New York, Boston. What we've seen uh, really in the last seven years is. Uh, uh, Prices in these markets have really risen dramatically, uh, especially in these core urban gateway markets. And we've seen it for a couple of years now as we have uh, transitioned uh, to meet the, a lot of the demand is an entry level uh, segment uh, in that first move up segment. So we're trying to provide product that's more affordable or attainable uh, in the marketplace today, uh, which is forcing us to either go higher in density uh, or further into the suburbs. Uh, and, you know, the majority of the U.S. market um, is still predominantly single family. Uh, and for us, as we think about our business and we want to build a long term sustainable business uh, in the for sale uh, business which we're focused on, we do see um, continued uh, movement into uh, whether it's called urban infill uh, or uh, suburban markets where we're building um, single family, either attached or detached product, but at a more attainable price point, particularly in places like the Bay Area, but also down here in Southern California. Uh, we're trying to provide a product that's just meeting uh, the greatest level of demand today, which is that millennial cohort group, um, which is that uh, first homeowner, which seems to be the most uh, short in supply. Um, so, I think that is uh, exacerbating the migration uh, to that uh, suburban market. Uh, but also, as we think about that, uh, the household formations that uh, are happening with especially the millennial group, um, they're demanding more space uh, as they make those um, uh, household formation decisions uh, uh, and continue to push them to a world that uh, housing, particularly when you know, think about where mortgage rates are today, uh, certainly that's driving a lot of people to accelerate that, uh, that first home or even a move up home. Um, uh, Thanks, John. Yeah, that was uh, really helpful. Appreciate the insight. Um, Brad, what, what about um, for what you guys are doing um, with regards to kind of current projects in the pipeline, future projects? Um, how are you guys viewing kind of this, uh, this movement that we're hearing about to, to some, some degree of more suburban lifestyles? Yeah, good. Well, um, great question. Um, and I think it's been one that everybody's trying to figure out. I don't think it's... I mean, first of all, I think John hit the nail on the head. I think what's happening is there's been a lot of different um, kind of forced decisions that have been put on people. Um, you know, for example, what I mean by that is you have a, in our business, in the multifamily business, um, a lot of folks that the millennials have been sort of putting off uh, probably the idea of going into the suburbs and essentially having a, a family or you know, making a change in life. Uh, I think that this whole COVID experience has sort of reset the bar. People have now decided to take some life changes. You see a lot of beneficiaries for suburban areas, some areas like Denver, Boise, markets like that, where, where you see a lot of trends and things happening. Um, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, what's happened is, 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 at least in our area here in the Bay Area and, and other urban, urban gateway markets, you've seen, you know, sort of that sucking sound where, 
you know, you just, you're not seeing the demand any longer. And in some cases, you know, demand for our, our business and apartments has really, um, really been uh, tough in some markets. You know, San Francisco is now down. I've, I've heard the latest that, uh, you know, rents and effective rents are off 25 to 30%. Some areas of the, of the peninsula are down 15 to 20%. Uh, we're finding that, um, you know, that, that, that's going to that's going to kind of reset the bar for a while. We've also seen that supply, is, you know, that's being delivered is really you know in a very difficult situation. So it'll be a while before we see demand coming back to the marketplace. Um, and from a you know from a strategic standpoint, you know, we've been benefiting here in the suburbs on the East Bay and on other areas in, in, in the Bay Area. We've seen it in other other markets as well. Um, but I think what will happen is, I mean, eventually, you know, we're going to see uh, demographic changes that will continue to happen. Um, and eventually, once this gets solved in terms of the COVID situation, I think demand will come back to the markets fairly quickly. Um, but I think it's going to take some time to see that. Um, so, you know, I, I think I think overall, um, you know, we'll lose some renters on the margin. But I think ultimately we'll see uh, it come back here uh, in, a, in a pretty quick way once we start to see some solutions here. And also from our perspective, uh, I'll add, you know, employers, you know, at this point are, are encouraging, at least in the tech business, are encouraging folks from working from home. And until that really happens, you start to see people saying, you know, come back to the office. That's also going to be a driver of demand. Great insight. Thanks, Brad. And I, I know that's a, a big question that we all have is, you know, will employers start doing that? At what level will, the, will they be more flexible? I don't think anyone believes that office space is going away. So, yeah, just, just a question of timing on when that happens. Um, and then, Lisa, what about you guys when you're, when you're kind of evaluating investment opportunities and um, kind of projects that you would invest in currently and in the, in the kind of short-term future, um, how are you guys looking at this kind of urban versus suburban phenomenon? Well, I wouldn't write off the cities um, right right yet. I think it's a, a short-term trend. I think when people go back to the office, um, the cities will fill up again. It's not a great time to own luxury residential um, in New York or in San Francisco or even in downtown LA. Um, so clearly we're focusing on more affordable projects. Um, that said, the market to buy multifamily is still extremely competitive and projects that are well located um, have multiple bidders and we haven't seen a big drop yet in pricing of assets. Um, I think at some point, if there was a repricing in the city center, um, there'd be some buying opportunities. But right now, we have not seen, and I don't know what my colleagues think, but we haven't seen a huge uh, adjustment um, in uh, pricing for the investment market. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I think you've got the pricing question, as you mentioned, and then I think um, one of the other questions that uh, that are that is continues to be out there is just development projects, costs of construction, both soft costs and hard costs. Um, are those are those projects feasible today, um, given the environment that we're in, um, both on the for sale side for say urban condos, pricing where it is. And then also um, on on multifamily developments, based upon some of the short term rent adjustments that areas like San Francisco have seen, um, the question is: Are new development projects feasible? Can they be in, underwritten um, given the environment that we're in today? Um, and Brad, why don't we start with you on the multifamily side? Yeah, um, I would tell you today. And it's, this is something that's happened also in the pre-COVID experience as well. These um, farm markets very difficult to find deal on projects, new projects, right? Uh, and prices suddenly, you know, just haven't increased. It's been mostly due on because of the 
water costs that you're seeing increasing here in the Bay Area, uh, it, it, I've never seen it so high. Uh, and it's been a real driver of, of us unfortunately not being able to, to uh, make deals pencil, um, even at the high rents. So now you have a situation where rents have dropped uh, between 10 and 30 percent in some markets, um, and pricing of uh, construction costs have not, has not dropped at least as of yet. Uh, we can talk about that further a little later here, maybe about where we see trends going in hard costs. But um, it's very, very difficult today, at least in our markets, to find any deal that makes any sense. Um, even at, it, it, Frankly, we've even underwritten deals uh, today, and there's zero land uh, value whatsoever. So it's been a very, very difficult thing to, uh, to uh, at least you know, put your finger on. Yep, thanks, Brad. And then, John, what about you guys? If you're if you're evaluating like a new condo development um, in a in a more urban area, like an urban infill project, um, are you guys still feeling pretty good about kind of absorption, um, sales, coupled with kind of the cost of development? Um, would love to hear your perspective on that. Um. If it's a low density condo development, uh, we certainly uh, are uh, still making those acquisitions. Um, you know, anything uh, that we can really stick to stick frame construction uh, in lower density, whether it's uh, townhomes or stack flats, uh, certainly uh, in the uh, Bay Area market, uh, whether it's in the Sil Silicon Valley Crescent. Uh, or um, in that East Bay, uh, if we can offer that product at a more attainable price point, um, we can make the, those uh, those deals work. Uh, prices have still been able to stay on the for sale side, uh, still quite still. Thanks, John. And then, um, Lisa, similar question for you, just as you guys are looking at investing in new deals, um, Given the environment we're in, with 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 costs um, and kind of you know the short term adjustments that have been occurring on rents, um, how are you guys looking at those? Well, I think uh, as my colleague said, I think new development is pretty hard to pencil. Um, you know, fortunately, we're in the value add space, so um, you know, Class B assets are still pretty attractive. Um, I think rents, you know, rents are down a bit. There are more concessions, but you know, from our experience, you know, occupancy has remained uh, pretty good, and collections have been pretty strong in the Class B sector. So, um, of course, you know, harder for new developments. You can't you can't really build a Class B asset anymore. It's got to be a Class A, right? So, that's that's a that's a tougher um, nut to crack. Yeah, I would say, Chris, let me add to that. I think that, you know, you're seeing a lot of folks, you know, rethinking their investment strategies. And um, at least from our perspective, uh, you know, ac the acquisition business is now something that probably has more credence in terms of the ability to perhaps find broken deals that um, might be coming around the corner or perhaps, you know, you've got uh, a lot of loans that are having a tough time being serviced, a lot of debt coverage issues, you're seeing things that, you know, eventually that you might say, might see some more disruption in the marketplace in the next 12 months, to, you know, or so as we start to really feel the impact of, uh, of, of the COVID experience on the markets right now. Yeah. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, it's been interesting, you know, multifamily just uh, in so many markets across the country has just been so competitive that uh, maybe something like this pandemic um, will actually provide some opportunities on the buy side, which have been very difficult to find for a lot of folks. So, thanks. Um, okay, before we move on, we're going to go ahead and jump into our second polling question. Um, and this, this has to do with what we were just talking about there and um, feelings kind of surrounding urban versus suburban markets. So what best describes your feelings towards the residential market? Cities aren't dead. We're going to see a max exodus to suburbs. The mass exodus to the suburbs 
is already well underway uh, and was before COVID, or I have no idea. So we'll go ahead and uh, give it a minute or so here to, uh, to see what everyone's response on this is. Going to give it a, a few more, another 15, 20 seconds here, and then we'll uh, we'll see what the results are. All right, so uh, yeah, I think there's uh, there there looks to be a lot of people that are in are in Lisa's camp as well, which cities aren't dead, you know. So it looks like almost half the folks believe that. Um, and then you know, yeah, the pretty 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 interesting results here. So uh, looks like only about 11 percent think that there's still uh, there's still kind of a significant exodus to come to the suburban market. So time will tell. We will see here. So thanks everyone. We're gonna. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next discussion topic. Um, so on this one, um, we were going to talk a little bit about just um, costs of development. Um, and this really has to do with more um, how things were looking kind of pre-COVID, how things are looking post-COVID, just from a demand perspective on and then um, in regards to certain trades, labor shortage was such a huge issue in certain markets, particularly the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, there was just a severe labor shortage for certain trades. I think you also saw some of that in, in Southern California and subcontractors were getting creative and trying to automate things like drywall. And so the question has to do with just, what are you guys seeing kind of from a cost of construction perspective um, now through the remainder of 2020 and then looking out to 2021. And then also with that, in regards to the trades, um, is, is the demand still such that we're still really feeling kind of that, that labor shortage um, for certain trades? Um, and on this one, Brad, I think we'll, we'll start with you on the multifamily side. Yeah, well, uh, in our world, um, as I said earlier, you know, the cost the cost of construction have continued to increase, uh, and it it's, it reminds me of the two thousand four through two thousand seven time frame before the, the GFC. You know, when we, we really saw costs just spiraling out of control, um, and now you have a situation where it's been exacerbated with uh, tariffs from international. You know, suppliers um, are finding that it's uh, now you have a, a significantly aging population in the workforce for building uh, in construction. I, I heard read recently that the average age of of the worker now is about 45 years old, and back in the in the, in the 80s it was around the mid 30s. So you start to see a real aging. The GFC just destroyed. You know the ability to find labor and and new folks coming into this business, um, and so from that perspective, it's, it really hasn't gotten any better. Um, and as you look at currently what's going on in this this current downturn, um, it, you know it's, it's it's really interesting. It hasn't really been driven by economics; it's been driven by this whole experience of this pandemic. And 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 now I think we're going to see a lagging effect here. Um, and I think what will happen ultimately, our, our, our thinking is, is that it will take probably another um, six months to eight months before we start to see um, contractors starting to think about their pipeline. We've been hearing more about it, that you, know, you start to hear, you start to see uh, more subs wanting to bid on jobs. Uh, we haven't seen any pricing decrease since COVID. Um, it's been relatively flat, I would say, from that standpoint. Really, this year, to answer your question on that part of it, we 
probably see we're underwriting now you know, small small percentages of increases through this year, you know, the rest of this year. Um, and next year, normally we'd be putting in now 68% inflation. And our, our costs today, now for the following, our underwritings are looking more of the 3 to 4%. We still think inflation has to be underwritten because we don't know enough about it to be able to predict what we're going to see costs of debt. But having talked to my brethren in the industry uh, and hearing anecdotally what's going on from their perspective, others that are actually bidding jobs right now, um, we're seeing that once they go to bid, they're able to get 2 to 4% cost savings, which actually is a positive sign that we're starting to see that happen. But on the other hand, and uh, I'm trying to hog all the time here, but on the other hand, what you're going to see is you're going to see, you know, we, we've seen things with lumber prices going up tremendously, you know, in, in the industry right now. And you're starting to see drywall just announced they're going to go up 10%. And I think either it has to do with the fact that these guys are taking advantage of these times right now in terms of suppliers realizing that perhaps there's going to be some adjustments that we can pour through in the future. But um, I think it's going to be sporadic in some of these commodities that you're going to start to see these, these increases spiking right now that I think it's hopefully going to level out here as we start to see more, more uh, uh, you know, less demand for, for contractors and, and more opportunities. Thanks, Brad. And then I think, John, um, you know, you guys being on both coasts, um, I think you'll you'll offer a pretty pretty unique perspective on this. But same question for you: just cost of development, demand for the trades. Um, how is that playing out um, in, in your world? Um, and do you see any kind of difference between you know, call it the West Coast and the East Coast when you're when you're thinking about your projects? Yeah, our, our, uh, probably our exposure mostly on the West Coast. Um, we have very limited on the East Coast, and the projects were bought out uh, pre uh, COVID. Um, uh, but we do see the additional cost of uh, during COVID. Uh, as you know, presidential team did as a uh, business. So we've been able to operate throughout this time. Uh, so labor has been uh, quite, uh, I think, abundant or available for us throughout this time. We've been able to get uh, uh, our trades and our subcontractors on our site uh, uh, very well. Um, we've had uh, probably more limits in how we can track those trades, given distancing and some of the operating features. So that's uh, extending out some of our uh, build time cycles. Uh, well, like what Brad mentioned, we did see that uh, really dramatic increase in lumber costs uh, and some other people, too. Um, we've been fortunate on the residential for sale side to be able to also catch up and mitigate that rising crisis uh, of residential, um, especially in the single family uh, space, uh, where we've been able to increase costs, increase prices with the increased costs. Uh, but we are uh, uh, getting a little concerned about um, in terms of taking too many um, sales right now. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that we're, we're sold out in terms of the rest of our deliveries for this year, first quarter of next year, and we're ready probably two-thirds for second quarter. So we're about seven to eight months out uh, from taking an order today uh, and delivering that home, um, which in the single family space, you know, that's a pretty long uh, cycle time. And then that comes with additional risk, uh, whether it's um, keeping that buyer in escrow or uh, uh, increasing. Um, so we're trying to uh, control that uh, along with our peers as well, too, who are doing that as well. So we're slowing down our releases which unfortunately probably is only going to exacerbate the uh, issue single family space. Uh, so that's what we're doing to help mitigate the future. Uh, but so far, prices have been able to continue to help mitigate the increase in the cost in the uh, uh, materials. Thanks, John. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about rent. rent collections now, some more on the multifamily side. 
um, you know, it, it, depending upon what you read, like the National Family Housing Council has come out and said, you know, rent collections on the multifamily side have been uh, really strong, uh, perhaps even north of 90 percent. Uh, if you talk to other sponsors or operators that have more workforce housing, uh, sounds like they could be feeling it more uh, than others. And obviously, you've got kind of the concessions and everything else being made on the new kind of Class A developments just now coming online. Um, so, Lisa, for, for you guys and in, in the assets that you're invested, generally with respect to rent collections, have they been pretty strong? And have you have you seen have you noticed any kind of difference depending upon the market you're in, whether it's urban, uh, more urban versus suburban, or if it's kind of Class A versus workforce housing? Any kind of insight you can provide on that? Uh, right. I mean, as I said, we're mostly um, invested in in looking for assets in the Class B space, and so collections have been surprisingly strong. I mean, definitely in the high 90s. Um, I think uh, that uh, we've heard we've heard that um, Class C again has been more affected. It's not a, a class of asset that we go after. Um, just sort of anecdotally, um, I think it also depends a little bit on the maybe the savviness of um, the tenants in a certain area. I know that. In Hollywood, I have um, some colleagues that invest in that area. Collections are very difficult, but I think a lot of um, tenants are aware of um, what they can what they can do, what they can negotiate. Um, but in sort of the general uh, asset type in the area that we're looking at, we have not um, seen collections as a big. A big issue. Concessions are definitely increasing. I think across the board, um, there's been some stress on rents as well. Um, but it, again, as I said, there's a weight of capital. Um, you know, COVID has not changed really the amount of money trying to come into the market. In fact, you know, some people are sitting on the sidelines, but many investors think it's going to be a great investment opportunity. So um, again, the market remains pretty attractive. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and Brad, what about you? What about you guys? What are you seeing? Yeah. So I just uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. I just changed from my mic to my headset. So hopefully you guys can hear me well. Yeah, that's better, Brad. Uh, we can hear okay, you good. good. Yeah, I got the I got the high sign here. Um, so. Um, I, again, I got a little cut out there, but the question is, are we seeing, can you repeat re the question quickly, Chris, because I was in the middle of trying to do that. Yeah, we were just talking about uh, rent collections in general. Um, you know, I think Lisa's comment was, you know, kind of overall amongst their portfolio, it's been really strong, potentially even in the high 90s. Um, so the question was just rent collections. How, how have they gone thus far? Sure. Are you seeing any kind of difference in suburban versus urban markets or workforce housing versus more class A assets, anything like that? Sure, yeah. Well, um, in our portfolio, you know, we our portfolio is as as Lisa mentioned, I mean it, it's more of a class A portfolio product. So we haven't seen um, the the stress on the on the renter as much in terms of probably the profile of the renter that we have in terms of them not being able to pay their bills. Um, so our collections have been pretty good in most of our assets. Um, um, I know that some of my friends in the industry that have assets that are more in in different demographic locations and, and you know have had harder times with it in terms of what's happening. Um, um, but I'd say that uh, the real the real unknown that we always need to figure out today is you know, how many of these folks are actually you know, participating in the uh, deferred, you know, payment, you know, slash, slash deferred eviction uh, process that's currently in place and how much exposure assets have uh, to that. And that's one that is really not very transparent, at least from, you know, what we've seen so far. Um, but um, we do know that um, uh, for the most part that that's going to take some time to work through. Um, 
but I'd say for the most part, you know, we haven't. I mean, I, I'd say the collections are in that. You know, we, we've had issues with maybe maybe two to four percent of some of our assets, and and for the most part, though, it's pretty straightforward. We haven't had too much of an issue. Thanks, Brad. Um, we've we've indirectly covered. You know what? Actually, before we jump into the next question, we're going to do the third polling question. Um, so, Gerald, could you tee us up for the third polling question? So, uh, how long will we feel the lingering effects of the pandemic in the residential real estate market? Is it is it six months? Is it twelve months? Is it twenty four months? Or are some of these changes permanent? Or we're just not sure. So um, we'll give it about a minute here for the audience to respond to these and um, give you some insight on, on what folks are thinking. And while we're talking about that, you know, uh, for the audience, we're gonna tr we're gonna save about uh, we're trying to save about ten minutes at the end um, for Q and A. Um, so if so, if anybody has any questions or topics you'd like us to cover, um, feel free to shoot those in. And time permitting, we're gonna try to cover some of those at the end here. So uh, I think this is another one where we, we have some variation, uh, but looks like most people feel for the next 12 to 24 months, we're probably still gonna be feeling this. So um, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, so the next thing we were gonna talk about here, we're just, uh, and we've touched on this a little bit, and John, I know you definitely touched on this, but just to, in terms of pricing, um, both on the for sale product and then and then pricing on the multifamily side, where that there certainly hasn't been the same level of transaction volume, um, but has NOI or have cap rates moved in any way that have um, kind of impacted pricing on the multifamily side and just on the on the for sale um, kind of single family and condo market side, um, does pricing has pricing been impacted any way? Um, John, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. I know you kind of touched on this a little bit already. Sure. Uh, you know, when I would say we came into this year uh, really, really uh, strong. I think uh, the home builder, uh, home building space and the single family for sale space, uh, as well as the condo uh, for sale uh, space. Uh, and then when COVID hit, really the third week of March, um, really saw a dramatic uh, drop off in demand. Uh, and April was probably the trough for us. Um, what was surprising for us in the uh, single family for sale space was in May, we really started seeing um, that demand uh, pick up. And then June was really a record uh, sales month for us. And then typically what's been a usually slower selling season during the summertime of July, August, um, we saw just incredible uh, demand in the uh, for sale side um, and pricing uh, increase as well, um, too, uh, especially in some of our larger, uh, I would say, homes. Uh, we have a project in the city of Newark in the San Francisco East Bay. Uh, we just saw incredible uh, demand uh, and we were able to increase prices there dramatically. Um, same thing in uh, down here in Southern California, uh, in the Inland Empire. We have a master plan community in Ontario. Uh, and the last couple of sales releases we had, uh, and we haven't seen this for a long time, we had camp out the night before. Uh, and these are about, you know, 2,500 to uh, 3,000 square feet uh, homes in that 500,000 to 600,000 uh, price point. So we're just seeing a lot of uh, demand for housing. And uh, I think this low interest and rate, rate environment um, and the, this uh, 
you know, COVID also driven related reasons for single family housing and more space uh, has really gotten people focused on making that um, home purchase decision. Uh, so for us, uh, we're going to finish the year probably a record in terms of orders uh, and sales um, and increasing pricing in all of our communities. I would say in the condo space, um, certainly New York is the most challenged, uh, but also I, w- uh, I would say in places uh, higher density uh, that have a higher uh, average selling price, if you're in the million, million plus, um, you're not seeing as robust demand. Uh, uh, and ability to increase prices. But if you're in that um, uh, FHA uh, uh, sort of uh, loan uh, limit uh, and conventional loan uh, limit, uh, that's making homes, um, single family homes, very attractive. Um, so we're seeing probably that pent up demand in the beginning of the year that really came through in the summer. Uh, and then also some acceleration of demand as well, too. Uh, through a combination of, uh, you know, the macroeconomic forces and some tailwinds uh, in, our, uh, in our industry. Thanks, John. Um, Lisa, I know you touched on this a little bit, uh, but just in regards to kind of um, pricing on either the buy side or the sell side, if you guys have had any recent exits on the, on the multifamily, multifamily side, have you seen much movement in pricing at all? Yeah, I think I, I think I touched on this already. Honestly, we have not. Um, I think, you know, the brokers that we've spoken to said they've seen anywhere kind of between zero to maybe 5% um, discount since COVID. Um, but it, re- it really depends on the location and quality of the assets. You know, we've bid on a few deals and just surprised at the number of investors that turn up. You know, we bid on some deal in Pasadena. There were 22, 22 investors during the you know COVID. Um, we didn't even get into the second round. Uh, I think interest rates are driving this, right? Interest rates are very low. Uh, Fannie and Freddie financing for Resi is super attractive. And um, there's nothing else to do with your money if you're afraid of the stock market. So um, both private and institutional money is going to keep going and pouring into real estate is my sentiment. Yep. Thanks, Lisa. And then, Brad, what about you, uh, whether on the sell side or the buy side? Um, It's really a a tale of two cities here. I mean, we end up with, uh, nothing being traded really uh, in on the, uh, in the peninsula or in core markets right now. There's too much distress. Folks aren't willing to give these assets away, and I don't, and I don't blame them. They're hard to get. Uh, and from that perspective, if you have the staying power to stay with the asset, I think you know most folks are going to stay. You know, keep keep holding these assets uh, until they you know see recovery in the market. I don't think you're going to see a lot of trading happening. In fact, I've I've heard that um, you know effectively. Sales of multifamily assets uh, are down about 45% in core markets you know, year over year, uh, in, at least in the in the Bay Area, other core markets. Um, now that's a little different though. When you go out to the suburbs, you're starting to see, you know, it's you're starting to see occupancies have, have you know, gone up. Uh, we looked at an asset you know, recently up in the Sacramento market, and um, they were raising rents since April. Um, because you're starting to see that migration going to these markets. And the same, same, we got, you know, uh, markets like Denver, uh, at least in the Western United States, Boise, Phoenix, they've all been recipients of, of a lot of demand. And you're starting to see capital seeking that, you know, flooding towards those investments. And so I agree with Lisa completely that you know, there really isn't a lot of other asset classes that make as much sense to go through uh, these kinds of periods. And this is why I think, you know, in our, in our business at least, I think multifamily is the best asset class to be in in situations like this. So I think it just goes to show that, you know, uh, some some of them are are, are being recipients of, of the goodwill and others are really having a tough time right now. Um, I wish I was in John's business, actually. Sounds like he's having a banner year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, you don't. Home building is never the. Uh, uh, we just happen to be this time around good. <laughs> Most of the time, we're yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, and then uh, question on just kind of um, investor appetite. You know, I think historically U.S. real estate has kind of been viewed as a safe haven um, and for, for capital coming from places like Japan, where you've potentially got negative interest rates, you know, um, the U.S. was pretty appealing um, even when our cap rates were on the lower side. But but given kind of the the global effect of the pandemic um, and what's happening today, the question is: Do international investors are they looking at the U.S. any differently? Have their return expectations changed? Um, are there other countries? Um, they're looking to invest in outside of the U.S. Is there a preferred product type? Kind of all, all those types of things. Um, Lisa, figured we'd start with you on this one. I mean, I think generally investors are still uh, bullish on the U.S. I mean, the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency. Um, I mean, I think that uh, actually... With interest rates down, we've seen more Korean investors uh, coming to the U.S. because hedging costs have declined. Of course, people are worried about the elections, right? So there's a pause, um, but I don't expect uh, foreign investors to pull out of the U.S. I, I, I think it'll remain a very strong market um, once we get through, hopefully, a smooth uh, transition to our next president in January. <laughs> Thanks. And then um, John and Brad, just um, would love to hear your per perspectives as well. Um, John, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I think uh, I, think I uh, echo what um, my colleagues are saying on this call, is that there is a lot of capital in the marketplace today, um, certainly looking for good investment. Uh, you know, one of the things for us is that as we try to continue to grow and expand our business, um, it certainly is uh, for home builders is a business of scale. Um, and, you know, we want to enter more markets uh, in the U.S., uh, Texas and Florida being those markets that we want to get into. Um, but we are looking to raise capital in the U.S. So one of the things uh, that we did, uh, we announced um, just a a few months ago is that uh, we're going to be going public through a SPAC transaction to raise uh, equity in the U.S., but also because we want to tap the public debt markets in the U.S. as well, too. There's a lot of capital in the U.S. Um, that's looking for um, good investments, and uh, currently um, the residential space, certainly uh, throughout this time and, and the pandemic, um, is sort of the brighter I think industry uh, in the across the marketplace today. When you think about what everything that we uh, are concerned about, or all the focus um, for 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 how we, you know we're operating and what we're doing even right now is you know a lot of focus on the home. And there's a lot of innovation that's happening there. There's a lot of uh, 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 new trends that are emerging there. Um, so it's an exciting time to be in that residential space, and you're seeing a lot of capital. Uh, come towards this space. Thanks. Yeah, I John. Don't, uh, sorry, Chris. Yeah, I was just to say, just to add on that, I, I I agree with, I mean, Lisa and, and John are probably, especially Lisa with your business on the international side, I mean, I, I, I think it's the same question, the same answer we gave before is there's a lot of capital in the markets and the U.S. will continue to be a safe haven for investments. And, uh, you know, you'll see that, you uh, in spite of the fact that uh, returns are lower, I mean, it's a much better place to go than some of the international markets would really have negative growth right now. So I think from that perspective, we'll continue to see capital going into into the into the U.S. and into our business. Yep. Thanks. And we, we uh, I think we've got time for maybe one or possibly two more questions, but we did want to talk about the uh, the credit markets a little bit, just the, the debt and kind of availability of it, interest rates, et cetera. Um, Lisa, I know you had touched a little bit on the, the agency financing. And, you know, I've had a lot of clients that have been really successful with agency financing on Fannie and Freddie and interest only and, you know, rates below 3%. So obviously you've got that component of the market, the agency financing side. Then you've probably got more, more traditional, just kind of, 
bank lenders, uh, but the, the, the credit markets in general, the availability of debt, and are you seeing any kind of new players like debt funds in the market and kind of a pullback from other players such as more traditional banks? Um, any kind of comment you can make on the, the debt markets? Yeah, I mean, the debt markets completely froze up for the first two months of COVID, um, couldn't get a loan anywhere. Um, but then they came back strong. I'd say, yeah, the debt players are pretty active. The debt funds are pretty active. Um, Fannie, Freddie, we talked about. Yeah, the, I'd say the banks are probably the least aggressive right now. Um, you know, your relationship bank is probably your best bet. I think banks are just being cautious because they don't really know how their own current portfolio is going to shake out. And so... I think if you're looking to open up a new banking relationship with a bank that you're not familiar with, that might be a little more difficult. So um, to the extent that you do have long-term relationships with lenders, that's probably uh, the most attractive, that and, and Fannie and Freddie. The debt funds are players, but they're always more expensive. Yeah, thanks. And then, John, what about you on... Um... I don't know if you have any projects where you're actively seeking construction financing, but availability uh, of debt for you when you're trying to go uh, vertical on projects, is it there? Is it the, the folks that you've been working with in the past, or is it new players that are in the market? Yeah, I echo uh, what Lisa just said as well, too. Uh, you're definitely working with uh, banks that you have existing relationships with. Uh, they're the ones that are expanding our credit facilities, uh, our revolvers, um, uh, and adding new projects. Um, we are seeing some more interest now, uh, especially given the, how hot the residential for sale market is right now with new banks. Um, but one of the things that has been really impressive to see is the public market. The public equity and debt market seem to be really um, doing quite well. Thanks, John. Same question for you, Brad, whether it's refinancing, construction on new projects, uh, I, I assume you're probably seeing something similar. Yeah, we are. Um, I think, um, anything, I, you know, I, I, again, we're not doing any real financings right now. We're, we're kind of in a good shape. But I think that what uh, we're hearing and seeing is that uh, anything below $100 million in our business uh, is, is being handled by relationship banks. Anything over $100 million would be your LifeGo companies. Um, banks, for the most part, if you don't have those relationships, are hard to do any business with right now, at least in the multifamily business for any new construction loans and such. Um, the days of non-recourse are have faded away in some respects. Um, and... Uh, there's other other caps and and, and parameters on, on financing that's currently happening. So it's, it's it, you know our business it depends where you're building. It's a tough it could be a tough environment right now in some respects. Great, thanks, Brad. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna uh, close it out with one more polling question, and then uh, I'll try to uh, address uh, some of the Q and A things that came in here in the last minute or two here. Uh, but the question is, do you anticipate seeing any kind of cap rate compression on multifamily assets? And if so, when um, A, six months, B, 12 months, C, 24 months, B, not for the foreseeable future. Um, so that's going to be our final um, polling question there. And then on the Q&A, there, there's been a number of questions that have come in just on uh, costs of construction, um, costs of lumber, um, automation and technology, um, and, and is that really playing a role uh, with subcontractors? Um, so I don't know if any of the panelists can can comment on that. I think we covered kind of the development cost question, but just um, when, when you're thinking about projects in the pipeline, um, I think, Brad, you had mentioned, hey, we're kind of looking at, uh, you know, kind of inflation type cost increases for most of our trades. But um, lo kind of longer term, what's the view on construction costs? Have we seen any kind of tech uh, disruption from a technological perspective? Um, 
for um, certain trades where there's actually true automation occurring and less manual labor. If any of the panelists would, would like to comment on that, would love to hear your input on it. Well, I'll start. I, I'll say that in our business, uh, in the multifamily business, you know, it's a it's a natural for bringing in eventually manufactured housing, modular housing, and and trying to be able to improve the supply chain and production lines. But it's still very early on. Um, you know, there's companies trying to do it, but we're, we haven't seen any profound. Um, anything profound coming to the marketplace that's really been able to be a game changer for us. Um, and we've, we've, we still build the way we've built for thousands of years. So unfortunately, you know, we're probably the last industry to really adapt technology in that regard. Um, and as far as, you know, just answering the question of what we see, yeah, I, I think, as I said earlier, I, I think you're going to see inflation, uh, but I think you will see some drop in costs eventually. I think we'll see some, some things happening, but it may not be as profound as we saw out of the last, the, uh, of the great, you know, GFC era, um, the last recession. I think, I think in this case here, um, Given the shortage of labor, I think it's going to be more of a V sort of recovery where, you know, the, the contractors will recover quickly and be charging just as much as they were before. So we're, we're, we have a very, um, at least in our business, a very uh, steep hill to climb um, to be able to continue to provide uh, housing to, to this, um, to our industry, which to our country, which is really needed here. So it's, it's a lot of challenging, challenging aspects in front of us here, at least in the multifamily business. Yeah. John or Lisa, I'm not sure if there's anything you guys want to add on to that. Obviously, welcome your, your insight as well. No, I would just tend to agree that we haven't seen any major technological innovation that we can use uh, in a mass scalable way, although we continue to, you know, to follow that um, possibility. I would just uh, maybe add one of the things that uh, we're excited about and we're driving uh, through our product that we're doing. Uh, you know, single-family construction is uh, in the U.S. is pretty traditional industry uh, and and not a lot of innovation and, and change there. And one of the things that we launched uh, uh, last year was our high-performance home program. And I believe today the millennials who we really focus on are in terms of our entry level and move-up segment there is a real demand and expectation uh, of home automation, uh, sustainability, uh, and energy savings there. Uh, so we really try to launch uh, throughout our products across the U.S. Um, a focus uh, and offering a standard home automation platform where we partnered with Apple, uh, and then also uh, uh, delivering uh, the most energy efficient home that we can with uh, upgraded insulation, tighter building envelope. Uh, and then on the sustainability side, uh, it really is about um, designing the most efficient floor plans, reduce your construction material waste, um, and get uh, and, and therefore reduce your purchasing costs. So I think there's a lot of room in the U.S. to improve of, uh, upon that. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of new technologies out there that we can be using, um, but it's an area that um, as we think about increasing costs like lumber and and, and materials, uh, if we can get more efficient uh, uh, and we can design our homes better uh, and leverage home automation and using uh, uh, technology uh, that's been developed, uh, I think uh, it's, an, it's an incredible opportunity. And I think consumers today um, expect it, they want it. Yeah, well, thank you, John, and thanks, Lisa, and thanks, Brad. Um, that hour went by really, really quick, but really appreciate you guys participating and everyone in the audience. Thanks for thanks for joining us and um, thanks for your questions. Sorry we couldn't cover all of them, but um, yeah, really appreciate it, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. This has been the Residential Investor developer and ownership trend session for the virtual 2020 building opportunity conference for more information please feel free to visit the resources widget here for you on on24 as well as mossadams.com a webcast survey is now uh, being pushed out to your web browsers 
We appreciate any kind of feedback that you'll be able to provide to us. Once again, on behalf of the team and the panelists here, thank you, and we hope to see you again at another session shortly. Have a great day.